You know, it was an Easter Sunday, late in the day, and Jesus was walking with two disciples on the road to Emmaus. You know the story well from Luke chapter 24. Because of his crucifixion just a few days before, the, the, these disciples, they were confused, they were disillusioned, and Jesus was going to open up some word of God to help bring them back where they needed to be in their, their faith. Now, you remember what happened. And, and Luke tells that story in Luke chapter 24, verse 47. Luke says that beginning with Moses and the prophets, Jesus explained to them what was said about himself throughout all the scriptures. Now, what a Bible study that would have been, right? Love to have heard which passage of scriptures from the Old Testament did Jesus choose to then expound upon and show what the scriptures taught about himself. Now, you know the scriptures he was using at the time. It would have been the Old Testament because we're not yet ready for our New Testament. And as he did his Bible study, he had to do it by memory. Because, you know, they didn't have the luxury you and I have today of having your own personal copy of the scriptures, certainly not one you could carry around with you as you're walking on a road. You had to have it memorized. And they did memorize their scriptures. And thus, they did their study, and they talked about passages because they knew their Old Testament well. Yes. Got to ask you the question, how well do you know the Old Testament? Now, I'm not so sure today we can even start to match what they could have done back then, though I'm looking in a room with an older generation, and many of you here are like me. You can remember growing up in a day and age where we did do a lot with the Old Testament in church. A lot of us back in those days, we heard some good Old Testament text sermons. And, and, and Bible school, well, the standard lesson often had the Old Testament text that would be used. And we grew up but back in a day of Bible trivia where they made you memorize things so you could recite it back. List the 12 tribes of Israel. List those first kings, Saul, David, and Solomon, and, and a whole host of other things. Yet we did grow up with Old Testament to a certain extent, though as we age, we have a tendency to forget some of that stuff. I wonder about our younger generation. From what I'm observing, I'm not convinced they're getting as much Old Testament as what we did. I think they get much less. Now, I see the sermons as they're posted. I, I see a lot of good sermons. I'm not seeing a whole lot of good study of Old Testament passages, bringing those truths out for today. You know, they get the, they get the good stories. The children's church will teach them those famous stories of Noah and the ark and Daniel and the lion's den. They'll get some key memory verses. But I believe that the modern-day church is woefully ignorant of the Old Testament. I also think that most of us don't care anyway, because after all, we're New Testament Christians restoring the New Testament church. And while knowing the Old Testament would be nice, that's not as important as knowing the New Testament. The New Testament is essential for us. The Old Testament is not so much. I'm here today to say something contrary to that. Because I want to speak a good word today for the Old Testament and how it is profitable for the church today. I've titled my message, The Old Testament Witness, and I want to show you why I think the Old Testament scriptures still matter to the New Testament church today. First thing I want to note for you is this, that the Old Testament was the Bible of the apostolic church. It was the Bible of the apostolic church. You know, back in those days, there was no New Testament until there was a New Testament. You know what I'm saying, right? First, you've got to write those books before you actually can have those books to do any kind of Bible study with them, and that's going to take some time. Those first New Testament books, probably written, the earliest ones, maybe about 15 years after the church started. A good bulk of them will be 25 to 30 years after the church begins. And even then, once they're written, doesn't mean you've got a copy to study. There'll be the one copy, the autograph, which a traveler would go around and read it in various churches, but it's going to take time before somebody can sit down and make a handwritten copy of that one. Now you've got two, and then copy that one. And eventually, over time, we'll have copies of New Testament writings that churches can have for their Bible study. But before that, their scriptures is going to be the Old Testament. That's going to be their Bible. Now, when you think about that, you realize then that when the New Testament sometimes describes those early apostles and evangelists taking the scriptures and using them in evangelism, things like that, you know what scriptures they're using, right? They're using the Old Testament. 
Because that's what was already delivered centuries before. It's already in written form and multiplied so that you could have those scriptures and do some study with them. New Testament will come along later. And when the New Testament refers to the scriptures and describes the nature of the scriptures, now it's true that what the New Testament says about the scriptures will apply in principle to the New Testament writings as they appear. But of course, keep in mind that when the writer says something about the scriptures, first and foremost, it's going to be the ones they've got in hand, if you will. It's going to refer to those Old Testament writings. So when Paul says in that famous text, 2 Timothy 3, 16, all scripture is inspired by God that will apply to our New Testament writings as they're being produced. But it will, of course, apply to those Old Testament scriptures. They are the inspired word of God. Now, that's what they've got in that first century situation. They've got Old Testament scriptures they will use in the work of the church. How'd they use them? Well, they used them in evangelism when they evangelized Jewish audience. This Jewish evangelism used a strategy, I sometimes refer to it as Paul's synagogue strategy. You can see it in the book of Acts. Watch Paul and Barnabas, later Paul and Silas. Watch Paul as he's traveling from town to town, and you can see a strategy come out loud and clear. In Acts chapter 13 on the first missionary journey, we, we find that they have arrived at the southern coast of what we today would call Turkey, gone about 100 miles into the interior to one of the many towns called Antioch, this one Antioch of Pisidia. Luke describes this, Acts 13, verse 14 and 15. He says, so when they arrived there, on the Sabbath day, Paul and Barnabas went into the synagogue. They joined in a typical Sabbath day worship service. It says at some point in the service, there would be the reading of Scripture. They would read a passage from the law, a passage from the prophets as they would rotate through the scriptures. And then once a passage is read, somebody is to get up and to expound upon the passage, to teach from it. Now, they had tradition back then. You got a visiting rabbi, a visiting teacher, offer them the opportunity to stand up and speak. It came around and so they asked Paul and Barnabas, would one of you like to get up and say a few words? Of course, Paul jumps up and said, be glad to. And you know what, Paul, he's going to take that passage and as he explains it, he's going to work it to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. That was the synagogue strategy. You could do that every Saturday, just traveling town to town. Now, you can only do it as long as they let you do it, and at some point, Jews will get tired of him running you out. You'll go to another town, another synagogue. That's a great strategy for evangelizing the Jews, and you use the Old Testament scriptures. In Acts chapter 17, a, another missionary journey, Luke is describing as Paul is beginning the same way, and it says, and as was his custom, because this is what he did, he went into the synagogue, and then he says he used the scriptures to reason with them that Jesus is the Messiah. That was the way they evangelized the Jews. You know, a good case in point is there in Acts chapter 8. Philip, the evangelist, and the Ethiopian eunuch. Remember what the eunuch was reading because Luke tells us he's reading from Isaiah chapter 53, the lamb that was slain. He doesn't understand it. But I like what it says in verse 35. It says, beginning with this passage, he preached Jesus to him. That's how they did evangelism back in those days. When working with Jews, it was so good to take the Old Testament scriptures the Jews knew and respected and then show from that how to come to faith in Jesus Christ. Now, you might assume that when we opened up the doors and brought Gentiles into the church and Gentiles became the majority and the Jewish portion became a smaller minority, you might assume at that point they'll dispense from the use of the Old Testament, move to something else. That's not the case. Those Old Testament scriptures that were useful for Jewish evangelism were also useful for church instruction. And they used it with the Gentile believers. Now you can see that clearly as you read through your New Testament. Get to the epistles especially. Because many of your epistles are written to an audience that's largely Gentile, less Jewish. You can see that even in the way that Paul will speak, for example, in Ephesians, where he says, there was a time that you people, you were outside the kingdom and outside of Christ, and you had no hope in this world, but now you've been brought in. You see, that's a Gentile audience. Well, as the epistles are written to these Gentile believers, here's what you'll find. They still quote, time and time again, from the Old Testament Scriptures. 
The New Testament epistles are filled with references back to the Old Testament with quotations and stories and names and such as that. You see, even Gentiles were taught the Old Testament scriptures because that was the Bible of the apostolic church. You know, Paul does this all through his writings. And in Romans, as he's going through chapter after chapter, and he's dropping this Old Testament reference and that Old Testament reference, he can come down to chapter 15, and he's going to drop another Old Testament reference. But he says in chapter 4, Now you know, what was written way back in earlier times was written for our instruction. Now, Paul knows how Scripture works. Whatever Bible author is writing a book of the Bible, if you will, He's writing it for a specific audience, Paul himself. He would write to this church or to that church, to this person or that person, and he's got an individual context in which he is addressing. But we also believe that what was written for a specific audience has application for all the rest of us. That Paul intended that after this is read, you take it to this church and that church and let them read it as well. It'll work for all. He's applying that same principle to the Old Testament. Oh, he would grant that all your Old Testament writings were written by the prophets for a specific audience, but they were also written for us. And thus the Old Testament became the Bible that was used by the apostolic church. Whether evangelizing the Jews or taking Jews and Gentiles and instructing them in their growth in the Lord, this is what they used. Because you see, the Old Testament is profitable for the church. But let me give you a second thing to consider. Because not only was the Old Testament the Bible of the apostolic church, it's the key to the New Testament. If you want to understand what the New Testament is saying, you want to interpret the New Testament and interpret properly, the key to understanding the New Testament is to know your Old Testament. Now when I say that, keep in mind, we speak in terms of New Testament and Old Testament. All right, We, we got those two, and that's our titles now, you know Jews don't refer to those same titles, right? They'll take what we call the Old Testament, and they'll call that the Hebrew Scriptures, the Jewish Bible, and the 27 books, that's the Christian Scriptures. Now, in describing the Hebrew Scriptures, that's pretty accurate because they don't accept the 27. It's just those 39. But folks, to speak of the 27 books as the Christian Scriptures is not quite accurate. For us, it's the whole Bible. We speak of the 66 our Bible is much bigger than that. You see, for us, it's the old and the new. It's not one versus the other. It's not as if the New Testament replaced the Old Testament. It's the old and the new, and that makes up the holy word of God that we use as the church. Now, think about the old in the new. Read through the pages of the New Testament. Every book, every chapter. You know what you'll find time and time again? Your New Testament writers put references to the Old Testament all through their writings. And you know one of the ways you can see that is if you've got a Bible, as so many of us do, that's got the footnotes plus the notes in the margin. Because what do those things do? They take a verse and a phrase in a verse and they point you back in the Old Testament where that comes from. They show you all the references. And if you notice it, it's all through the pages of the New Testament. In fact, sometimes you're looking at a verse and there's a phrase and they got this little A. Well, that comes from here. That same verse can have a B, a C, a D, and an E sometimes. I mean, there's just so much throwback to the Old Testament. Now, what you'll find as they throw it back to the Old Testament is what I'll call some good references. Sometimes it's actual quotes, direct quotations, sometimes a, a paraphrase. Sometimes it's just the dropping of names, names of characters or names of places and events. And sometimes it's just a smorgasbord of all types of things that it sounds a lot like what we call an illusion. An illusion would be this alludes back to this passage. It's said in different words, but it's, that's where that idea comes from. Your New Testament is filled with references back to the Old Testament. Now, when you think about that, just think about some of the ones that you will run into on a daily basis as you're just reading through the New Testament Scriptures. You'll find, for example, where the New Testament will just drop something on you. And if you know your Old Testament, it makes perfect sense. You know exactly what it's referring to. Take, for example, names. You know, all you got to do is just throw the name Noah. And what's everybody already know? The ark, the flood, the animals. All it takes is just that one word, but there's a story that comes up from that one word. You can even go more obscure than that. You can say a pillar of salt, and still, most of us know, oh yeah, that's the Sodom and Gomorrah story with Lot and his wife, and 
Yeah, we get that one. You can even do what Hebrews 11 does when it says, And by faith there are some who shut the mouths of lions and survive the flames of fire. And those of us who are thinking book of Daniel, we're thinking what? Daniel in the lion's den and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. See, that's illusions where you just, you do this one little thing, but it points back to something bigger, a bigger story. Now, the, the whole beauty of that is if you know the Old Testament, then as a New Testament writer, all I got to do is just drop a little something. And the little nugget I drop takes you back to the fuller story I wanted you to recall. Well, that's what the New Testament writers do page after page, chapter after chapter. And you know what that means, folks? To be a good student of the New Testament, you've got to be a student of the Old Testament. A lot of us don't bother with that. You know what we do? We read the New Testament text, makes per perfect sense to me, I'm done. Except that the writer may have had more in mind than what you spotted because you didn't take the time to go back and open up the context of the Old Testament. Yeah, I think we've done a pretty good job in our modern church of trying to show our people how to read scriptures and interpret well. The, the, the whole idea of hermeneutics, good exegesis. What have we taught our people? By example and sometimes by just simply telling them. We've tried to teach them, for example, that when you read a book of the Bible, like one of the New Testament epistles, first you need to know the background of the composition of the book itself. Who's the author? To whom is he writing? Approximately when? And what was the circumstances he's addressing? We, we've tried to teach our people such things. We've tried to teach them such things as, as you're reading it, it helps to know a little bit of the historical situation so that when it mentions something, you understand it not in 21st century terms, but how it worked back then. If Jesus is talking about fishing on the Sea of Galilee, find out how they did fishing. And, and if you're talking about farming, find out how they did farming versus how we do it today. We've tried to teach our people about historical situation. We've also taught them context. Don't take a verse out of context all by its little lonely, but rather read the scriptures verses that are in front of it and behind it. In fact, if you really want to do diligence, go ahead and read the context of the epistle itself and see how it fits into that. Or maybe the rest of the epistle is written by the same author. See, we've done a good job of teaching those kind of basic hermeneutical rules to our people. I think a lot of them know that. You know what we sometimes forget? The even greater context of the Old Testament. Because as you and I are looking at our New Testament passages, sometimes we fail to go back to the Old Testament reference and open that up as we're studying our New Testament text. I recommend if you truly want to understand the New Testament, you need to do that. You need to go back to where they pointed you in the first place. You know, that's especially true if you're going to study the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is just filled with everything Old Testament. And to do justice to a study of the book of Hebrews, you're going to have to take every reference and take them one at a time and go back and read the chapters that it comes from. It's a lot of work, but it will open up bigger ideas than you would have spotted all by yourself. You know, in Hebrews chapter 2, as the Hebrew writer is going along and he's referring to Jesus and what Jesus says, but he's using Old Testament quotes, Jesus, he's not ashamed to call them his brothers. And I will put my trust in the Lord. And here I am ready to serve you and my children as well. We read that and say, okay, I get it. I know, go back. Go back to the Psalm 22 and see what was said when that little statement was said. There's a lot more there. Or go up to Isaiah chapter 8 and find out more about Isaiah and his children before you walk away from that text. With the book of Hebrews, you need to go back and see the original references. In fact, really, how can you ever understand all of the arguments of Hebrews about Jesus is greater than the angels and Moses and Joshua and the priests and the sacrifice and the sanctuary until you first go back and find out more about such things from the Old Testament. Yeah, to do your Old Testament studies and use that in connection with the New Testament, that's how you'll come to an understanding of what they meant to teach you. Book of Revelation is the same way. Actually, Revelation has more Old Testament references than Hebrews, and Hebrews has a lot. But I think that's a mistake so many people today make as they're studying Revelation and, and they're imagining what it means because that's what it means to me and they're giving you all these great ideas. Great ideas I would often say no to because I tend to go back to the Old Testament. See, when I take the symbols of Revelation, so many people look at them and say, well, here's what that symbol says to me. I don't care what it says to you or to me. 
I go back to the Old Testament. What's that symbol used time and time again? And when you see the pattern of how it's used there, now you know what it means as you're reading Revelation. You're going to have to study the Old Testament to understand the New. But, you know, that's going to be true for Paul's epistles and the other epistles. They go back and use the Old Testament so many times. It's even true for studying the Gospels as Jesus is living in the Old Testament age. He's going to start that New Testament age with his death and resurrection. To understand his life circumstances, to understand his teachings, you need to be a student of the Old Testament. We sometimes fall short of that, don't we? Of, of really understanding all the things we need to know in order to explain the one thing that I wanted to know. Well, the early church understood that. And they understood that if you're going to understand these new teachings that we have, you're going to have to go back and understand our old teachings. That a New Testament student needs to be a good Old Testament student. I'll give you something else to consider this afternoon. Because the Old Testament, it was the Bible of the Apostolic Church, and it was the key to understanding the New Testament. It was also a guide for Christian ethics. The guide for Christian ethics. You know, when Christianity comes along and we're getting started, the apostles got a lot of work to do. They got to get things in order in behalf of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They got to set up his church, organize the leadership and get the mission going. There's a lot of work to be done. I'll tell you one job they didn't have to do. They didn't have to create an ethics system for Christians, a Christian ethics, if you will. They already had one. It was the moral teachings to be found in the Old Testament scriptures. They already had an ethical system. You see, if you think about it, the moral principles that were taught in the Old Testament derived from the God who gave them. They were based on His nature, which is like a rock. He's unchanging, which means a moral principle of God, once it's spoken, that thing is going to be solid no matter how far down the road that you are. It doesn't have to be reinvented. It's, it's there. And thus, there was a strong ethics that was already in place when the church came along. It was there in the Old Testament Scriptures. Now, what that means is that they're going to have to teach this but they're going to teach it by using what was their Bible, by using the Old Testament Scriptures. Now, you'll find that they do that, and, and Paul will sometimes remind you that's what we're doing. You watch him in 1 Corinthians. He goes from chapter after chapter after chapter. You know what he does? He tells the church of Corinth, now in this you're wrong, in that you're wrong. And as he does, he often tells them why, and oftentimes throws an Old Testament quotation at them. He gets down to chapter 10. Twice in that chapter, you know what he'll say? Now, when these things happened... They happened as examples to instruct us because it's his understanding that it's from the Old Testament, from the didactic teaching to the examples of people doing right and doing wrong. That was intended for us to learn from it. That's where they're getting their right and wrong is from the Old Testament scriptures. That also explains why as you see Gentiles come into the church and you see New Testament epistles being directed toward Gentile believers, why they'll be filled with so much ethical instruction. You see, Gentiles will have to be taught a biblical ethics. Now, you don't have to take Jewish Christians and teach them Christian ethics. They were already trained in God's Word and what God's Word said about what is right and wrong. What you have to do with them is just remind them to do it, like we have to remind ourselves from time to time again. But it was the Gentile believers who needed to be instructed from the Old Testament in God's moral principles. And that's what we see the Old Testament being done in the New. And you know, I like these moral principles because moral principles are nice and neat general rules that can then be applied to the varieties of life. You get this principle, this general idea, and then as life goes on and as things change and new things come, those old principles apply in new and fresh ways to new circumstances of life. Like the old classic, don't lie, cheat, and steal. You know, that's, that's as old as the hills, and it's not going to go away. Don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal. But, you know, that has so many different applications. Lying can be done a variety of ways, can't it? Everything from the bald-faced lies, you stand there and talk to a person, to raising your hand in a court of law and committing perjury, to fraud over here as I'm trying to sell you something. And the application is numerous from that one principle that we speak the truth, we don't say what is false. Or stealing can be done in so many different ways. Everything from armed robbery, which we say, I don't do that. Yeah, but also, as you know, there's a variety of other ways we sometimes take what is not ours. 
And so principles have to be applied. Now, this is where knowing your Old Testament comes in so helpful for Christian ethics. Because while the New Testament specializes in stating the moral principles of our ethics, it's in the Old Testament where you get the abundance of application. See, it was Moses' style that if he's going to teach you something, he didn't just give you one sentence like Paul will do. Paul can say, practice sexual purity, no sexual immorality. You know what Moses does? Gives you two whole chapters of, let me tell you all the things not to do. Now, that's the same thing. Here's the principle. But Moses, let me show you the applications. And in sexual immorality, he'll go through that long list that you and I know of things that are wrong. That's very helpful. It's helpful because it reminds me of things I might have forgotten, but it's also helpful because I need to be reminded that when you get the principles of ethics that the New Testament gives you, you need to take the time to expand it into its application. Because sometimes we can preach and teach at church these great principles, and then people go through their lives and don't have a clue how this principle applies what you just did. We've got to learn about application, and the Old Testament reminds us of that truth. I'll tell you something else I like about using the Old Testament when you're thinking Christian ethics. It reminds you that what was once said is still being said to this day. Once you see this pattern of ethics that runs through the Scriptures, then you realize that what is being said today from our New Testament perspective, that this is wrong, and some today will say, yeah, but things change. Uh uh not with God, because God's moral principles are constant, and I'll show it to you, not just in Paul, but the prophets and Moses, and even back to the days of the patriarchs. It just reminds us that these moral truths just remain true. You'll get that from your Old Testament study. I'll also tell you this, as you study your Old Testament looking for your Christian ethics, Sometimes it's fun not to start first with the principle of the new and then go back and see applications in the old, but turn it around. Take one of those obscure rules from the old and see if you can work it towards the principle that still abides. Now, of course, there's some things we're going to have to drop because the New Testament makes that so clear. The old rituals that relate to the ceremonies of their Jewish worship and faith, a lot of those are by the wayside, Paul teaches so clearly about circumcision and the festivals and new moons and such that. Yeah, those things, we don't carry those in. But the moral principles are still abiding. And that's why you take those ethical applications and work back to the principles. And that's a fun thing to do. It takes some work. Paul does that, for example, when Paul can quote the Old Testament text from Deuteronomy chapter 25, where it says, Do not muzzle the ox while he's threshing the grain. Here's the ox, and he's walking across the grain. You want broken into pieces. Maybe he's dragging some heavy stone over it time and time again to break it up into the smaller pieces so you can get from that the, the wheat that becomes your bread. Now, a Jewish farmer might be inclined to put a muzzle on the ox so he doesn't eat any of that good stuff. Paul says, no, if he's going to work for you, then the labor is worthy of his hire. He ought to be paid for the work he's doing. Paul takes that ox story, turns it into a principle about paying people fairly for the work they do. In the case of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, paying a preacher for the work he does. Or in 1 Timothy, elders and ministers who work for the church. You do that in the Old Testament, you'll have a lot of fun and be reminded of some good principles the New Testament teaches and the Old Testament just showed you an example. Take, for example, the rule that says when you on your house you need to have ramparts around the roof. Reminds me of those old castles that had those ramparts around the top. My roof doesn't need that, does it? Eh, maybe not my modern roof. But when you understand those flat roofs of the day, and people did a lot of life up there, they cooked up there, they ate up there, they slept up there, kids played up there. You know what he's saying? Build a railing around places where somebody might get injured and fall. It's the concept today of negligent liability, where you had a ladder leaning up against your house, and some kid climbed it and fell. Should have taken that ladder down when you got finished. Or this crack in the sidewalk that you've already got the citation, you need to fix that, but you don't. Somebody trips or hurts themselves. It's, it's a simple principle taught by that one example. And on and on in other kinds of New Testament, Old Testament workings together. The gleaning rules. Leave a strip of your harvest for the poor to come. That's the principle of benevolence for the needy. You see, this is where Old Testament, New Testament studies working together can help us see what we call Christian ethics. The moral principle spelled out in the New Testament, but the Old Testament helping us to see the multitude of applications. 
I think if we're going to do Christian ethics and do it right, we need to be students of the Old Testament. But you know, the Old Testament, so useful to that early church, it was the Bible of the apostolic church. It was the key to understanding the New Testament. It was the guide for Christian ethics, and it was the foundation for Christian doctrine. I say the foundation for Christian doctrine. Now, I know what we've all memorized. Acts chapter 2, verse 42, everybody in this room can say it. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. Luke is describing four things that from day one became important, and they regularly made sure they were doing these four things. And at the top of his list, what was it? The Apostles' Doctrine. The teachings the Apostles gave. Inspiration of the Holy Spirit with some new revelation for the church to guide the church, and that was so important to them. And I say amen to that. We're still committed to the Apostles' teaching, to what they gave us. But as you look at what the Apostles gave us, there are not as many new doctrines as you might imagine. You might imagine that Christian doctrine is made up of a whole bunch of new ideas. No, not so much, really. Because what you'll find as you study the, the doctrines of the Christian faith is a lot of our ideas have their roots back in the words of the prophets. You know what Peter says about that in 1 Peter chapter 1? He describes the prophets of old. Remember what he said? They prophesied of the grace to come. That's a good way of understanding how Christian doctrine relates to the Old Testament prophets. They spoke of the things that later will be explained in greater clarity by the apostles. But it's not like they're creating brand new doctrines. It's grounded in what was already said, but not fully comprehended. It, it was beyond their grasp, but now let's show you what it means. Now, when you think about it that way, you understand why it's good not just to study your New Testament for Christian doctrine, but to go back and see the Old Testament as well. You think about it, a lot of the ideas that are part of Christian belief and practice, their origins are back there. To truly understand this reference, you'd do well to go back and read the earlier versions of it. So, for example, just telling the story of Jesus and his death on the cross, the meaning of his death, and of our salvation through Christ. Boy, that gets into so many things like blood sacrifice, redemption and reconciliation and high priest. And, you know, all that stuff, New Testament refers to it. Old Testament tells you more about it and where it all came from. Helps you to understand what the New Testament is teaching about Jesus. Same is true if we go through a lot of our practical questions. We're always wondering how to structure the leadership of the church, elders, deacons, preachers, I suggest you go back and read your Old Testament scriptures as well because they didn't have to vent how to lead God's people. There was a leadership for God's people that was already there. You can learn a lot from reading from the origins. Same is true if you want to know about worship. They say a little bit in the New Testament about worship. Old Testament will set you up and put the two together. It clarifies things. Even giving, the New Testament likes to refer to it, but as the Old Testament says so much more and even gets in such things as the principle of tithing to God. You see, you want to be a good student of the Old Testament as you are studying your New Testament doctrines. And the truth is, there's a lot of ideas in the New Testament that just barely get any reference at all. And why? The Old Testament already said plenty. The doctrine of creation is referred to in the New Testament, but you want to get the fuller story, go back and read the Old. Or take, for example, image of God mentioned in the new, but let's go back and let the Old Testament show you more. Even the nature of mankind. New Testament says some. The Old Testament will give you so much more that's not even said. And the nature of God. Oh, of course the New Testament's going to refer to his nature, but it's in the Old Testament. It's passage after passage that describes his nature with great imagery and words. You see, to really do Bible doctrine right and understand your Christian doctrine, it's not just the New Testament. You want the old and what it contributes. You know, for many years, I was a professor of theology teaching the doctrines that the church needs to know, what we need to preach and teach. And, and I still look at my notes today, and as I look at my notes, here's what I find. For every Bible idea that I wanted my students to know, I'd give them two or three good scriptures for them to hang on to. Now, there may be dozens of scriptures that would speak about this idea, but they don't need dozens. I wanted them to have two or three just real sharp, you read this, it makes perfect sense. You know what I discovered? 
And I'm looking back, I've got about as much Old Testament scripture as I do new in a class that's teaching the doctrine of the church. Because you see, it's not just a New Testament thing. Oh, the early church understood it's an Old Testament thing as well. Because good Christian doctrine is grounded in the teachings of the inspired prophets of the Old Testament. You know, I think about this. One of our restoration slogans has been that we are a people of the book. I like that. I like it that we see the Bible as the authority. We dispute practices and traditions that can't be found in, in God's Word. Amen. You see, I like that that we call ourselves a people of the book. But you know what I think about us as a people of the book? A lot of times we're a people of the book, if you're talking about that little Bible pocket New Testament. It, it, it's, it's nice and convenient. It fits in your pocket. And if you needed to, you could pull it out and show somebody about faith, repentance, and baptism. It's a nice little thing. You know what? It's missing a whole lot of the whole counsel of God. It's missing so much of the inspired word. And I suspect that for many of us, as a people of the book, that's the book really that best describes us. That's a shame. Because if we truly are a New Testament church, we want to be like it was in the beginning when the apostles were setting it up. There is one good lesson we can learn, and that good lesson is this, that of the many things that are profitable for the church, you make sure you understand that on that list is the Old Testament, because the New Testament church needs to know its Old Testament. God bless you.